So, masculinity. Wow. Uh, in 1968, I'm eight years old. I'm living in Chicago. And um, it's, it's very snowy. My dad's finishing a residency there. And so I'm walking home from school. And there's this girl, Robin. And I have a real crush on Robin. And so she's walking in front of me about 15 feet. And I'm going, I like her, but what do you do with her? It's like a dog chasing a car. You know, what do you do if you actually catch the car? So I'm walking along. And I think, well, I've got to show Robin that I like her somehow. So I do the only thing I know how to do. I pick up a snowball, and I call Robin's name. I do my guy friends. And she turns around, and I throw it at her. <laughs> and my aim was too good, and I hit her right in the face. Wham! <laughs> so Robin stops. She looks at me, you know, memorizes my face, bursts into tears, and runs home to her mother. And so I stand there on the sidewalk wondering, what just happened? <laughs> Sometimes I must admit I'm still that eight-year-old on the sidewalk when it comes to masculine and femininity. <laughs> now, I, I progressed a little bit. We got into high school in Texas, God's country, as, as uh, Dr. Watson pointed out. And so um, how do you prove you're a real man? Playing, of course, you play football, right, in Texas. That's Friday Night Lights. We actually beat those guys, by the way, for the state championship, Odessa Permian. I was on the team. You know, it's not every day 40,000 people in Texas Stadium in Dallas, and you beat Odessa Permian. I was on the, it, it was awesome. So we're practicing, though, in the swamp-infested southeast Texas. And um, how do you prove you're a man? Well, there's clouds of mosquitoes everywhere. And so I look down, and you know, our shins below the football pants are covered with mosquitoes. Well, you're a guy. You can't slap them, right? You know, you're a wimp. So you have to sit there and let them bite you. <laughs> no big deal. Mosquitoes don't bother me, right? <laughs> so that was the sign of a real male, was who could stand there and we'd look at him, boy, look at that, there's 50 on his leg and he's not slapping them. That was the sign of the male. And uh, you know, I wonder if Darwin would have looked at that and said, natural deselection at its finest. <laughs> and, and so this is, really, this is really where the male began to shrink, probably. It was right there on our football field. OK, so September 27th, issue of Newsweek cover story proclaims the end of masculinity as we know it. And uh, quote, quote, the traditional males and endangered species it's time to rethink masculinity. The article continues, what's the matter with men? And this is all quote, for years the media have delivered the direst of prognoses. Men are in decline. Guys are getting stiffed. The war of boys has begun, and so on. This summer, and continuing the quote, this summer the Atlantic's Hannah Rosen <laughs> went so far as to declare that the end of men is on us. We're done. And uh, end quote. Okay, so the article goes on then to cite evidence, the workforce. 70% uh, male in 45, now less than 50% today. In the largest cities, young, single, childless women are an 8% more than comparable single men. Today, right now, it's already, it's changed, swapped, flipped. Um, men have maintained their lead in alcoholism, suicide, homelessness, violence, criminality, while women have surged past them in college graduation and graduate school. Sorry guys, this will get good in the end. <laughs> now, the article goes on and they kind of do their little historical review. And of course, this is Newsweek now. I'm not saying this is, you know, this is what Newsweek says. This is how they see the world in terms of the history of men. A history of masculinity in America divided into periods, such as the patriarch of the 1700s, the family man of the early 1900s, uh, the white collar conformist, and they sub-break these. I didn't do it here. They have the muscle man of World War II here as well. Uh, and interestingly, from the 60s to the 80s, they talk about the Playboy. This is Newsweek. And they're not apologetic about it. They're like, yeah, this is great. This is where the Playboy emerges, as defined by Hugh Hefner. And he's their kind of definitive guy for the 60s. You know, and of course, he published Playboy, what, 50, 53, 55, right in that area, um, 53. We'll, and we'll come back to that later, to this one, the Playboy. Cutthroat capitalist, new age man. Present day is the new macho man, personified by Brad Pitt in the, in the Newsweek article. They have a picture of Brad and Angelina there. And um, they point out that he chooses to have children. And yet they don't really emphasize that they haven't married yet. They haven't seen a need to. The uh, point of the article is summarized, quote, men have a choice. This is the, really the summary of this article. Men have a choice. Either feel inadequate or get a lot more creative. Okay, that's what Newsweek says we need to do as guys. Uh, not change anything else about ourselves. Uh, not, you know, change the labor force. The focus is more on acclimating to the new masculine, not trying to change anything about this educational ebbing that we see. So, and we do celebrate equality in society, um, but it's the demise of the male 
that's seen most strikingly in education. In 1982, women and men achieved parity, equality in, in college education. That is great. You know, way to go girls. I mean, we're glad they came up there there. But equality, there's 50-50. We'd like it to stay there at least, and it hasn't. In 2004, it was 58 to 42 percent in favor of women. Among um, blacks, it was 67 to 33 percent in favor of women. In the journal Demography, Depreet and Buckman comment on the growing gap, expanding on it in the American Sociological Review, quote, the rising female advantage in college at completion is an important topic of study both in its own right and is a rare example of a reversal of a once persistent pattern of stratification and because of its potential impacts on labor markets, marriage markets, family formation and other areas, shifting educational attainment rates for men and women could affect gender gaps in labor and wages, labor force participation and it may affect women's desire to marry as more of them marry down, delay marriage or forego it altogether. These changes could have a profound effect on family formation and parenting. We just heard some pretty ominous data if we consider that data in this context. While we celebrate the gains made by women in higher education, the story here is the high dropout rate in college for men. The authors have no firm causative data. They look to correlative factors and infer why women have been motivated to step up to the plate, but the question remains, why are males checking out? What is distracting them? So in considering these questions, let's first go back and consider science, unencumbered by sociological perspectives and random definitions. In this world of shifting gender roles and moral and behavioral relativism, let's go back to the inherency of biology. Masculinity and femininity are inherently biological roles. Uh, it's the ability, in any biologic population or species, it's the ability of that population or, to, or DNA line to replicate or reproduce itself. And that's what achieves a successful species, is reproductive success. When a species is on the endangered list, among other things, biologists look at environmental factors which might impact mating patterns and in turn affect reproductive success. It, masculinity and femininity are inherently biological roles with cultural overlay, fostering expression of these roles in society. So the term lek refers to a gathering of males before and during mating who then compete for the right to mate with females, whether the contest is of plumages and birds or of crashing antlers as in rams, or of crashing helmets, <laughs> as in humans. The biologic advantage is that the strongest males produce, uh, reproduce and pass their DNA on to ensure survival of the species, right? This is, um, you know, good um, survivalist biology. So in this sense, maleness or femaleness is inherent. It's based on physical, emotional, and social manifestations of the primary and secondary effects of the sex hormones. These hormones with minor changes are widely conserved in vertebrates and are obviously expressed in humans. Culturally, there are those that would minimize any differences between men and women, while others yearn for a world free of men altogether. Yet the inherency of biology is based on biochemistry, on the interplay of human sex steroid hormones. These hormones mediate development of the physical development of the male and female and mediate reproductive behavior as well. Both hormones, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, these are all present in both sexes. But it's the balance that counts. It's different amounts. Testosterone, for instance, is present in much higher levels in males and is responsible for the primary and secondary male sexual development characteristics and drive, while estrogen and progesterone serve the same role in females. But both are operative in both sexes, however. It's the biologic balance that is critical. For instance, uh, estrogen is even important in uh, sperm motility in the, in the male testes. And androgens actually, or, or estrogen actually masculinizes the male brain. Alpha fetoprotein protects it from that masculinization. There's a lot of inherency and balance here. But it is the biologic balance that is inherent, critical. So what behavioral effects does testosterone have? Aggression in males, whether it's mice or men, some studies have questioned this more recently. In other words, 
um, does it really cause aggression in males in phys physiologic amounts? There's one study, for instance, and this is all in the reference, my reference page. These studies are there for you. Suggest that testosterone actually boosts social vigilance and increases skepticism. So it may aid rank competition in human interactions. Women given testosterone were found to trust other humans less than women who had not received extra testosterone. It also may serve as a social balance to oxytocin, higher in females, which increases trust in humans and is important in female sexual and reproductive physiology and in pair and maternal bonding. Competitive sports increases testosterone in both men and women. Both are operative in males and females. Again, it's the balance that counts, the biologic balance that provides the drive that produces what we translate culturally, socially, and behaviorally into masculinity and femininity. We cannot change this inherency. While some may protest and thrash about gender ambiguity, same-sex families, and stem cell produced sperm, they will never be biologic entities able to demographically reproduce the species at the 2.1 fertility rate needed for replacement in humans. Modern pharmacology does not allow these, those confused as to gender identity to masculinize women and feminize men. They, we can do that with pharmacology today. Plastic surgery can supplement the confusion to produce hermaphroditic hybrids who change from Harry to Harriet, but there are no sexual chimeras. The genotype of cross-gender confusion is still male or female, and this inheritance exists in each cell in the person's body. Of course, there are those born with sexual ambiguities, and these are biologic aberrations, though. Modern medicine can sometimes address them phenotypically. So for perspective, let's add the overlay then of culture to the term masculine, to the biology we've talked about. So what is a real man in the traditional sense? I've told you the Texas man, okay? You've got to feel for that. Um, it's not, ask the ancient Greeks and they'll tell you a man's judged by what he does more than who he is. Michael Hertzfeldt said in quote, in Glendiot idiom, there is less focus on being a good man than on being good at being a man. A stance that stresses performance excellence, the ability to foreground manhood by means of deeds that strikingly speak for themselves. Anthropologist Dr. David Gilmore cites Philip, cites Philip Slater in describing this influence as follows, quote, it shows up in Homer in the Iliad most visibly and Achilles' willingness to trade a long uneventful life for a brief one filled with honor and glory, and in Agamemnon's willingness to trade several months of his life for an honorable death on the battlefield of Troy. Other classic, end quote, other classic masculine characteristics include protector, and provider in the Mediterranean and in other cultures. On Truck Island, for instance, in the South Pacific, a real man is not only tough and brave, but also extremely protective of women. Uh, Russian traveler Frederick Lukti in 1828, way back then, described, quote, extraordinarily de extraordinary defensiveness, end quote, of the women by men, a defensiveness that continues today in this particular culture. The East African Samburu tribe requires a, circ a very painful circumcision ritual. The adolescent male to be endured without flinching to enter Moranhood or to become a man. The Maasai Moran must be brave as well. They undergo the same circumcision ritual as the Samburu and the Maasai Moran must always be ready to confront danger from killing lions to fighting other tribes. Accumulation of wealth is another measure of maleness in Samburu culture. Possessing cattle and herds signifies status in Samburu and Maasai culture, society. And the mark of high status is having enough to give it away to others. Gilmore describes this as follows, quote, A high point of the boy's Moranhood is the sacrifice of his first ox. The major portion of the meat is then given to the boy's mother as an act that is described as a thank you to her for having reared and fed him as a boy. This ritual feeding of his mother symbolizes the boy's status reversal from consumer to provider of meat and thus indicates a responsible adult manhood. Similarly, the Jewish standard for a true man is that of a provider who is helpful and considerate to dependents. The term for a real man in both Yiddish and German is Minsk 
And Gilmore says, quote, even secular assimilated Jewish American culture, one of the few in which women virtually dominate men, he said that I didn't, has a notion of manhood. The wife who is satisfied with her husband will say he is a mint. So clearly these windows into traditional male roles are being challenged and changed for each of the cultures we've addressed. I'd like to focus on Western culture. How's the new macho male doing in the Newsweek article? The unmarried father, who seems to be more committed to kids than partner. The European male, how are they doing demographically? I mean, with the male role as defined by reproductive success in mating patterns, to use a biologic term. In Western culture, not very well. If we look at fertility rates, in the end, demography will tell the final tale of how each culture's interpretation of these gender roles succeeds in reproducing that culture. The rest is just conversation. If the fertility rate stays at or above 2.1, that particular DNA line will survive. If below it will become extinct. When a human culture reaches a fertility rate of 1.3, it's virtually, it's called lowest low, it's virtually impossible to recover and that DNA line is destined to evaporate, to disappear. Germany, Japan, much of Western culture is near this number. And as one German gov government ministry official put it recently, if things didn't change, they would be, quote, turning the light out, unquote. The dem demography of the dissolution of the traditional family and the crashing fertility rates in the developed Western world, it's far too complex to do justice to in these few minutes. We know the commonly given sociologic reasons. We've talked about some already today. Urbanization, birth control, abortion, the incentivization of marriage and subsequent childbearing and rearing, blurring of gender roles, etc. That these are secondary factors and are important is not in question. But any who write on this subject disclaim definitive causation, yet rarely discuss this decline in the context of the dissolving Western family. With that preface, I would like to go back to the primordial emotions, to look at the basic primary survival drives. Sexuality, in my opinion, has been vastly underrated as a demographic factor. I think Tom Wolfe, author, author of The Bonfire of the Vanities and The Right Stuff, was onto something when he said, the bigger pornography gets, the lower the birth rate becomes. He's not demographically naive with his PhD in American Studies from Yale, as we've seen, liberalizing sexuality does not correlate with increasing fertility rates. It's the opposite. Alfred Kinsey's bombshell book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, which proclaimed that, unemotionally, that emotionally unattached, unbonded, and when unbonded, I'll defer to Dr. Carroll, I like that last night. Let's be careful with unbonded. What's a bond? It's marriage, okay? So unmarried sexuality was not only acceptable, but was a universal human right. This is what Kinsey said. And it was a seminal event in the current cultural emasculation of the male. This work masqueraded as science. Despite its scientific and ethical lapses, there was no random sampling in his groups. And it's now acknowledged there was an over-representation of homosexuals and, uh, and prisoners. Dr. Judith Reisman's documented how tables 30 to 34, and this is um, table 34, from that book, it's Kenzie's book, copied from his book, describe the systematic sexual abuse of young male children as young as two months, and Kenzie collaborated with and encouraged these pedophiles, instructing them to time what were termed orgasms in these children with stopwatches. I call upon the Kenzie Institute and its sponsoring institution, Indiana University, to open all data on the boys and girls of tables 31 to 34. Where is the longitudinal data on these children? There is no statute of limitation on child abuse, criminally or civilly. So it's impossible to talk about masculinity today without talking about the impact of pornography. Did Kenzie start it? No. I've been to Pompeii. If you've been there, you've seen the murals. But cyber acceleration of the internet has changed the game, big time. And so unfortunately, any objective discussion about the science regarding pornography has been silenced by the $97 billion, that's that many zeros, 
per year pornography industry and its apologists in their rush to label any constraining dialogue moralistic value-laden infringement on First Amendment rights they are also silencing, silencing meaningful discussion about whether it could have any harmful effect, emotional effect, physical effect on humans in the context of human pair bonding. Sex Week at Yale presumes there is no emotional or demographic effect to unattached, unbonded, unmarried sexuality, yet this assumption has been taken at face value with no social science to support it. While many factors contribute to the male malaise we are seeing, it's essential to understand the power of pornography on formative male sexuality and its subsequent effect on culture and demography. Hugh Hefner said, if Ken, quote, Hugh Hefner, quote, if Kinsey had done the research, I was the pamphleteer spreading the news of sexual liberation through a monthly magazine, but also living the life as well. End quote. In 1953, Hefner published the first issue of Playboy, which included a centerfold of Marilyn Monroe. Recall the Newsweek article describing the Playboy as defining a generation? In his first issue, Hefner describes the ideal male or Playboy in the magazine. Quote, within the pages of Playboy, you will find articles, fiction, pictures, stories, cartoons, humor, and special features to form a pleasure primer styled to the masculine taste. Notice those two words. We'll come back to them at the end of this lecture. Pleasure and masculine. We, pl we plan on spending most of our time inside. We like our apartment. We enjoy mixing up cocktails and an hors d'oeuvre or two, putting on a little, mood, a little mood music on the phonograph, and inviting in a female acquaintance for a quiet discussion on Picasso. Nietzsche, jazz, sex, end quote. Pornography's come a long way since Hefner, with today's internet acceleration becoming a real game changer. According to the landmark paper published by Dr. Jason Carroll, would you raise your hand, Dr. Carroll, who's with us today? And his associates, 87% of college-age men and 31% of women watch pornography, 50% weekly, 20% daily or every other day. Internet pornography has become the sexual socializer and instructor, what are they watching? It's certainly not the Hefner centerfolds of the 1950s. Robert Jensen, Gail Dines, Ann Russo, Pamela Paul, I understand was here last year, and others have laboriously documented the content of today's internet porn, and it's truly a brave new world, with boundaries lasting only as long as it takes a dopamine receptor to downgrade. The theme is that women are objects to consume and discard. Forgive the bluntness, but as a physician, I believe this is a societal sickness, and I must therefore speak frankly. Jensen and Dines document, and this is supported by data from the Gridson paper published in the American Journal of Public Health, that the universal ending to all pornographic movies concludes with the male masturbating on the female. This tragic symbolic misogyny is designed, and we'll go into the design part in a minute, it's not by accident, it's designed to dehumanize the female. Indeed, the growing craze of gonzo porn is in reality a mixture of sex and insult. The male insults and demeans the female while committing sexual acts on her and to her as an object, not with her as a person. In June, Time Magazine showed a picture of Aisha, the Afghan girl whose nose was cut off for fleeing abuse, and we rightly condemn the inhumanity of the Taliban. Yet Western culture tolerates cutting off the humanity of women by tolerating the hate against women inherent in pornography, which is calculated. By striking down the congressionally passed and presidentially signed Child Online Protection Act, the Supreme Court has ensured that pornographers remain the greatest teachers and trainers sexually of our next generation. Remember, young males 12 to 17 are the main group viewing pornography. And Bill Margold, a famous pornography male scar, is their teacher. He said, we have to understand this or we won't get it, quote, 
I'd like to show what I believe the men want to see, violence against women. I firmly believe we serve a purpose by showing that. The most violent we can get, forgive us, is a cum shot to the face. Men get off on that. Because they get even with the women they can't have, we try to inundate the world with orgasms in the face." End quote. Yet in the very act of debasing a female, the male is debasing himself. As he destroys the beauty, mystery, and majesty of her femininity through the hate sex inherent in porn, he destroys his own masculinity. True biologic masculinity and femininity are complementary, not destructive. The mark of the true man is not to be cruel to a woman, but to love her. The masculine will be inspired by, be bettered by the female, not coarsened. As Jane Austen's Darcy said to Elizabeth, quote, your reproof so well applied I shall never forget had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner. You showed me how insufficient were all my pretensions to please a woman worthy of being pleased." End quote. Is pornography accelerated by the internet the only factor in the decline of the male? No, but as a powerful biologic drive it certainly is a major factor. Interestingly, that proponents and defenders of pornography deny that it could have any negative effect at all, that it really doesn't matter what we watch, has no, it has no effect on us. If this is true, the field of advertising is most overrated. Those who pay three million dollars for a 30-second Super Bowl ad are being robbed. The Bergner study showed that pornography damages pair bonding in humans, and the Hald meta-analysis published earlier this year, demonstrated a strong association with pornography viewing, both violent and nonviolent, and attitudes of objectification and acceptance of violence against women. And this Hall and meta-analysis did look at the previous Martin meta-analysis, which was criticized, removed the weak studies from that, and incorporated the current uh, studies, the ones from Denmark, that tried to take a softer view on pornography. So it took everything together. This study, when it's considered in the context of Dr. Carroll's study showing that nine out of ten men and one in three women view pornography, has ominous social and demographic implications. It does indeed have an effect, what I like to call a visual pheromone effect. In 1869, the gypsy moth was brought to America in an attempt to jumpstart a silk industry. Rarely have good intentions gone so wrong as the unforeseen appetite of the moth for deciduous trees such as oaks and maples, elms, devastated forests for the last 150 years. Numerous strategies have been employed to destroy the pest. Every pesticide we could come up with to kill them, we couldn't. Nothing we could do could get rid of these moths. No amount of pesticide. However, in the 1960s, scientists noted that the gypsy moth males finds the females to mate with her with, by following her scent. This scent's called a pheromone, and it's extremely attractive to the male. So in 1971, a paper is published in the journal Science, which used pheromones to prevent moths from mating. The scientists mass-produced the pheromone and permeated the moth's environment with it. Note the title of the paper, Insect Population Control by the Use of Sex Pheromones to Inhibit Orientation between the sexes. I mean, just let these words sink. I'm talking about moths, but people too, okay? Also pertinent to this summary from the abstract of the paper. We have for the first time obtained experimental confirmation that pre-mating communication between the sexes can be disrupted by permeating the atmosphere with an insect pheromone. Follow-up paper 1971 describes population control of the moths by preventing male gypsy moths from finding mates. Quote, uh, yeah, the, uh, that was the quote, uh, preventing from finding mates. The gypsy moth was the first insect to be controlled with pheromones, and it works by two methods. One is the confusion method. So this airplane flies over, scatters a bunch of very small pellets, in, uh, environmentally insignificant. These little pellets are spread over a large area, and just one little, it's little plastic pellets, you can't even see them. I mean, one moth, I forget what it was. Don't, I mean, 
but it's like a, a pellet or two per every acre. I mean, it's, it's, and yet that much pheromone was enough to cause the male to be overpowered and he couldn't find the female. He, felt, he basically saw females everywhere. The other is called, and, and so he's desensitized to the natural scent of the female. That's what happens by the artificially produced pheromone. So an Australian article describes the confusion method this way, quote, and again, translate, the, quote, the male either becomes confused and doesn't know which direction to turn for the female or he becomes desensitized to the lower levels of pheromones naturally given out by the female and has no incentive to mate with her. Other methods, the trapping method. So the male moths enter a trap with, in, uh, embedded with the pheromone. They can't exit. They die in the trap. Pornography is a visual pheromone. It's a powerful brain drug. It's changing sexuality even more rapidly through the cyber acceleration of the internet. It's inhibiting orientation and disrupting pre-mating communication between the sexes by permeating the atmosphere, literally, through electronic media. It works with moths and it works with people. With internet pornography becoming such a game changer, let's consider the question, can compulsive pornography use become an actual addiction as defined neurologically? Consider the words of this apologist for the pornography industry. Quote, while much has been written and said about pornography being addictive on par with drugs, booze, and cigarettes, it's important to consider this misinformation has been based upon questionable science and the opinions of anti-porn activists, not upon any legitimate unbiased research. Consider also the fact that drugs, booze, and cigarettes are all physical, chemical agents that are ingested and in, can indeed have measurable, harmful, addictive effects. The mere viewing of any type of subject matter rare, hardly falls into this category, and in fact, but little is the very real battles that addicts face over drugs, booze, and cigarettes, all of which can be lethal. No one ever died from looking at porn. Wrong. While some compulsive types can be addicted to anything, such as watching a favorite television show, eating ice cream, or going to the gym, nobody suggests that ice cream is akin to crack cocaine and should be regulated to protect people from themselves. Instead, these compulsive actions are rightly viewed by society as personality defects in the individual." End quote. Okay, let's consider those statements. Surprisingly, some therapists, uh, unaware of current brain research on neuroplasticity and neuromodulation, agree with this pornographer's view as well. So, given the nine out of... Oh, thanks. Given the nine out of ten number, from Dr. Carroll's paper, it's obvious it will be increasingly difficult to have a verifiable control group, won't it, for a carve-out pornography study. And the other issue is the social environment. It's impossible to discuss any restriction of sex objectively. Immediately, apologists will decry any objection to pornography or homosexuality, for instance, as coming from a moralistic, religious, value-laden perspective, and therefore plead First Amendment infringement on free choice. Not only is the social debate stifled, but an objective scientific debate on inherency in biology is effectively silenced. So is there evidence that addiction can exist outside the realm of drug addiction? Are there natural addictions characterized by compulsive consumption of natural rewards? Let's take a few moments and consider recent evidence from the scientific literature on addiction and also statements from some of the world's leading addiction neuroscientists. Consider then for yourself whether there's evidence that pornography use can become an actual addiction. I believe it's essential to understand this evidence as found in current peer-reviewed scientific literature to understand what is happening to males and masculinity, given their vulnerability to visual stimuli. So the, the brain has a pleasure salience reward center, this frontal lobe. If the brain were a car, the frontal lobe is the brake. It says, whoa, horses, the neo neocortex. It says, think about it. And we see it in neurosurgery all the time. People with car wrecks, frontal lobe damage, they're compulsive, impulsive, emotionally label, and exhibit impaired judgment. We call it hypofrontality. We see it in neurosurgery. What got me interested in all this in the first place was my brain patients. And Nora Volkow then writes a paper saying, 
Our addiction patients act just like traumatic brain injury patients, like they don't have any frontal lobes. They do the same thing. Impulsive, compulsive, lack of judgment. Same thing. So what happens? You've got a frontal lobe here. It, is, it says, don't do it. Think, reason. And then you've got a midbrain. The midbrain cranks out dopamine. Dopamine is a, I want that neurotransmitter, excitatory neurotransmitter. It does a lot of things, and, and just this is an hour lecture, which we don't have time to do today. I'm just going to go through this for five minutes instead of an hour. If you're ever interested, I'd be happy to come, and uh, the science is it's my favorite thing to talk about anyway with this. But, so you have this, this dopamine that's produced. It says, I want that. I, it's a salient center. So then what happens is the ple this pleasure center which is the nucleus accumbens, the dopamine will go and say, you want that. When it's overused, the brain says, you're killing me. This is too much. So it says, hey, frontal, it, it says, hey, pleasure center, hey, dopamine factory, shut it down, guys. I've got to do other things to survive as an organism. The pleasure's great, but it's too much. So there's actually a downgrading that occurs. This is simplistic, but basically, the dopaminergic systems downgrade. The amount of dopamine in the terminals, the dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens, which is the pleasure center, they all downgrade. Also, paradoxically, the glutamate output of the frontal lobe, which feeds into some of the inhibitory neurotransmitters, neuro, neuro, uh, such as the, some of the GABA cells, it shrinks. You think the brain shrinks, gets smaller? Yeah, the cells get smaller, and it actually shrinks as well. And we can measure that, and you think, yeah, right. It does. We'll, sh we'll look at that in just a minute. So then what happens is the frontal lobe doesn't work as well. So it's like, hmm. There's, the brake is broken. Think of it as we're putting too many miles on that car and we're wearing out the brake pads. And so the, derm the, the thermostat of the dopamine is a higher level. Now there's less dopamine around in the brain. So when the person's not acting out in their addiction, whatever it is, chemical, behavior, whatever, they're craving dopamine now. They want more dopamine. And so there's the old and the new, normal. I've got to have more dopamine to survive. It tricks the brain. So they remember from this amygdala, remember how great that was? You've got to get your dopamine to survive, or I'm going to die. It's a, it's a hijacking of the pleasure center that tells us to survive, to eat, to reproduce. In 2001, Howard Schaefer, head of addiction research at Harvard, said in the journal Science, quote, I had great difficulty with my own colleagues when I suggested that a lot of addiction is a result of experience, repetitive, high emotion, high frequency experience. But it's become clear that neuroadaptation, that is, changes in neural circuitry that help perpetuate the behavior, occurs in the absence, even in the absence of drug taking." End quote. As Stephen Grant of the National Institute for Drug Abuse, or NIDA, said, quote, this is still from the science paper, and these references are all in my handout. What's coming up fast as being the central core issue is continued engagement is self-destructive behavior despite adverse consequence. It's behavioral addiction. In 2005, Dr. Eric Nessler, head of neuroscience at Mount Sinai, and one of the world's most respected addiction neurophysiologists, said, quote, growing evidence indicates that the VTA and CA, that's ventral tegmental area and CA, that's the pleasure dopamine pathway, VTA and CA, pathway, and other limbic regions similarly mediate, at least in part, the acute positive emotional effects of natural rewards. Not just drug rewards, but natural rewards such as food, sex, and social interactions. These same regions have also been implicated in the so-called natural addictions. Now, when a neuroscientist uses the word addiction, he's not being flippant. They don't just say addiction. Is it an addiction? They mean addiction neurochemically, okay, when Dr. Nessler says this word. It's not casually. That is compulsive consumption of natural rewards, such as, these are his words, pathologic gambling, path, or pathological overeating, pathological gambling, and sexual addictions. So let's consider several parameters of research which support this. What are ways we can measure this? In 2001, a study on cocaine addiction was published. It demonstrated measurable volume loss in several areas of the brain, including the frontal lobes right here, which are important in volitional control and judgment. The technique used was an MRI-based protocol called voxel-based morphometry, or VBM. The brain is, for those of you neuroscientists out there, it's cut up into little one millimeter cube slices and voxely measured then. These little voxels become ways to measure volume changes in the brain. They're quantified and compared. And then another study in 2004 on methamphetamine showed the same thing. It showed similar findings, frontal lobe 
and, and other areas actually got smaller, 8 to 12 percent. Volume changed. The cells got smaller with addiction. But we're not surprised, are we? You know, these are real drugs. Remember the old commercial, this is your, the egg, this is your brain, this, whoosh, this is your brain on drugs in the pan, you know, remember that? So we think, yeah, sure, that can, can fry your brain. But it becomes more interesting when we look at a natural addiction, such as overeating leading to obesity. In 2006, this VBM study was done, and there's the frontal lobe again, which showed that there was shrinkage that occurred in these areas in obesity. Very similar to the methamphetamine and the cocaine studies. So this is a significant in demonstrating visible damage in a natural addiction. It's still easier to accept though. We think, well, obesity can be seen. So yeah, it's, that's pretty amazing that a natural compulsive overconsumption can cause a neurologic change in volume. But it's still, we can see that it causes the person to physically change. So yeah, I can, I can buy that. But then this, what about destructive compulsive sexual behavior? 2007, a VBM study out of Germany looked specifically at pedophilia, demonstrated almost identical findings to those seen in the cocaine, methamphetamine, and obesity studies. In other words, this study demonstrates that the, a sexual compulsion is associated with a physical anatomic change in the brain. Is it causation or simply correlation? Two VBM studies show reversibility of anatomic change associated with addiction. One a methamphetamine study and another an obesity study. These studies then support causation, not just correlation. Another preliminary study describes frontal lobe damage specifically in patients unable to control their sexual behavior. This study used diffusion MRI to evaluate function of nerve transmission through white matter where the axons or wires connecting the different areas of the brain, brain cells are located. It demonstrated dysfunction in the superior frontal region in an area associated with compulsivity, a hallmark of addiction. So another parameter then is we talked about shrinking brains. What about I talked about dopamine receptor downgrading a minute ago? So in drug addiction, the brain downgrades the dopamine system in an attempt to return to more homeostatic physiologic use. So what happens then is this. These are dopamine receptors in the, in the pleasure center. And notice, in addiction, what happens is you have fewer receptors come down on this curve. So to feel good, which is above the pleasant line, it's necessary to boost the dopamine signal or the amount of dopamine way over here to get above the line of pleasure or just feeling good, neutral, being pleasant. So because there's not many dopamine receptors, you have to get it way over here on this line. Whereas a person that is not addicted, that has a normal number of inherent receptors, actually, if they're shocked with over overstimulation, they will actually feel unpleasant initially, although the curiosity will work on their, on their mind if it's a drug or if it's a, a, a behavior. So it's a losing battle. And numerous studies have demonstrated the long-term, we call it long-term depression and long-term potentiation, the neuroplasticity. Dr. Norman Doidge in his book, The Brain That Changes Itself, they're all talking about this plastic brain concept. Doctors Cowher and Malinka, uh, Stanford, in their landmark paper on cellular mechanisms of addiction, quote, addiction represents a pathological yet powerful form of learning and memory. I love this quote. This is a great quote. So these addictive changes in the dopamine reward system can be scanned. We can see them with functional MRI, PET, SPEC. While we would expect a brain scan to show abnormalities in dopamine metabolism and cocaine addiction, like this study does, we might be surprised to find that a recent study showed the same thing in pathological gambling. And another one on addiction. So again, na this cross of drug versus natural addiction. We call natural addiction, or Dr. Shaver uses the word process, or addictions to a process versus a drug. So natural and process addictions are synonymous terms. Okay, so Delta Fos B. We've got to get this. Delta Fos B is, in my opinion, perhaps the most fascinating, convincing work in this regard with regard to what's happening with addiction. So this chemical was initially found in the pleasure centers of brain cells of animals that were addicted to drugs, but not unaddicted controls. It's back in 99, 2001, Nessler's team. So they find this, this switch, this chemical. And the, the Fos family is important 
it works with an, another protein, another switch in the brain called activator protein 1. And it just turns out that these, this FOS family is integrally, uh, intimately connected with that protein. And it, it in, can, causes this cell to act in a number of ways to, to help with life and, and even development in initiation and embryology, but also in function and in pleasure the FOS family is active as well. Well, most FOS chemicals disappear quickly. We experience pleasure, they're gone. Delta FOS B sticks around. It doesn't go away. It stays there for weeks and weeks. And he found that. And he found it 10 years ago in drug animals, only drug animals. He thought, oh, wow, we've got our marker. Well, then he found this also in natural rewards in the last five to six years. And interestingly, now most of their work on Delta Fos B is in its inherency in the body. Wow, overeating causes Delta Fos B levels to go sky high. And recently, a couple of papers on hypersexuality in his rat models, sky high on Delta Fos B. Now, a recent study found that just physiologic sexuality does, is, the Delta Fos B is involved in physiologic sexuality as well. So, you know, it, we've heard the term addicted to love. Married people are bonded to each other. Is it an addiction? No, because it's not destructive. Could a marriage be addictive if natural appetites, even sexuality were, of course, but there's this real bond where the brain wants us to lock in to reproductive sexuality with our marriage partner. So we reproduce our species and it's inherent. And so Delta Fos B is a real player now. And a recent paper looked at two overconsumption of natural rewards, eating and sexuality, and this is from that paper. Quote, in summary, the work presented here provides evidence that in addition to drugs of abuse, just get this, and this is huge, natural rewards induce Delta Fos B levels in the nucleus accumbens. Our results raise the possibility that Delta Fos B induction in the nucleus accumbens may mediate not only key aspects of drug addiction, but also mm -hmm. aspects of so-called natural there's that word again, addictions involving compulsive consumption of natural rewards. This just came out this last year. This is a fascinating study. This is the Pitchers group and they did two papers, one on Delta Fos B with and then another one on neuroplasticity, both with sexuality. And so, and Nessler collaborated on one of those papers, by the way. Delta Fos B now appears to be a molecular switch. It mediates a sort of pleasure reward memory in the brain cells. Earlier this year, for the first time, it was found to serve a role in sexual motivation reward incentive. Concurrently, the same authors demonstrated that sex induces dendritic arborization similar to that originally seen in cocaine addiction. So, naive cell here, this is a nerve cell with the axon, the wire, the dendrite. Notice the arborization is growing out. So, 10 years ago, they found this and said, yep, that's a cocaine addicted rat. Well, guess what? One act of sexuality in the rat, and a week later, after a period of abstinence, dendritic arborization. That's how powerful the reward is. And that correlates with the hostage paper, which showed that sexuality in a human male is akin to a heroin rush in terms of the areas of the brain that are simulated. Powerful brain drug. So, fascinating paper. Again, few arborizations after sex, more arborizations. Neuroplasticity. I'll let you decide for yourself. Does it change the brain? Dr. Nessler said, this raises the interesting possibility that levels of Delta Fos B in the nucleus accumbens or perhaps other brain regions could be used as a biomarker. Now this, he gave this at a talk at the Royal Society in London about two years ago. I mean, the society, you know, started in 1600, longest running scientific journal in the world. Okay, this is where he gave this and this is published in that journal. It could be used as a biomarker to assess the state of activation of an individual's reward circuitry, as well as the degree to which an individual is addicted, both during the development of an addiction and in its gradual waning during extended withdrawal or treatment. Problem is we can't measure, until we get a biomarker where we can label it radio you know, and look at it with petter spec, we can't see it yet. Um, in rats, it's easy. You do the rat, section the brain, Label it, there's the Delta Fos B. It's kind of hard in humans. Any volunteers? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, doctors Bostwick and Busey at Mayo Clinic recently published a paper describing, this is from their paper, 
describing the treatment of internet sex addiction with naltrexone, an opioid receptor antagonist. They concluded, and I quote, in summary, cellular adaptations in the addict's prefrontal cortex, remember that break of the brain, result in increased salience of drug-associated stimuli, decreased salience of non-drug stimuli, and decreased interest in pursuing goal-related activities central to survival. We believe this is the first description of its use to combat internet sexual addiction. That's their words, these Mayo Clinic psychiatrists. Again, all these people using the word addiction, just throwing it around, okay, just let that sink in. Okay, now here's another one, Dr. Nora Volkow's head of the NIDA, one of the most published and respected addiction scientists in the world, whereas Dr. Nestler is more of a neurophysiologist. Dr. Volkow publishes all these scans, like a lot of the scans showing dopaminergic downgrading with human brain uh, scans. Um, she, she really does a lot of that work. And she has recognized this change in understanding of drug versus natural or process addiction in advocating, actually changing the name of the NIDA to the National Institute on Diseases of Addiction, as quoted in the journal Science. This is what she said. NIDA director Noah Volkow also felt her institute's name should encompass addictions such as pornography. She said that addictions such as pornography. Gambling and foods that NIDA's advisor Glenn Hansen. She would like to send the message that we should look at the whole field. So there are other neural mechanisms at play. There's the oxytocin, vasopressin, axis. Um, these chemicals create bonding in our brains. They're both important in physiologic sexual functioning. They also are important, Larry Young's work and others, to show that they create emotional bonding to the object of sexuality. So we're wired to bond. So all the hookup culture is fighting biology. I believe bonding then to the experience of object sex can also be real. I think there's a role for oxytocin, as my opinion, but I think there's a role for it. And I think these powerful chemicals play a role in that. And don't forget the importance of the mirror systems of the brain, the mirror cells, which project realism into what the brain is seeing. A study on 2008 in pornography and mirror systems concluded, we suggest, this is out of France, we suggest that the mirror neuron system promotes the observers to resonate with the motivational state of other individuals appearing in visual depictions of sexual interactions. In other words, as far as the brain's concerned, seeing is being there. So if we argue that natural addictions exist and the evidence is that they do, uh, it's substantial, I believe, then pornography addiction is defined by Dr. Bostic at the Mayo Clinic is the prototype natural or process addiction. It's the king of the hill. If they exist, it's number one. Increasingly, in the face of overwhelming evidence, it, to believe otherwise suggests either bias or ignorance. On the question of whether or not natural or process addictions um, exist, I agree with uh, Dr. Schaefer at Harvard. Quote, although it's possible to debate whether we should include substance or process addictions within the kingdom of addiction, technically there is little choice. Just as the use of exogenous, that means from the outside, exogenous substances precipitate imposter molecules vying for receptor sites within the brain, human activities stimulate naturally occurring neurotransmitters. The activity of these naturally occurring neurotransmitters, uh, psychoactive substances likely will be determined as important mediators of many process addictions or natural addictions, like food, sex, gambling. In a 1990 study published by doctors Korenman, who was here at Princeton at the time, and Dr. Newmark, found that marriage makes men more productive. And we heard that this morning with Dr. Kim as well. Certainly, in the last 20 years, this has been borne out with the macho, the new macho male now eschewing marriage and dropping out of college and out of life. Where are they going? As Dr. Carroll and his associates have pointed out, they're going to the virtual woman, to the false masculinity inherent in object sex. How can true masculinity, masculinity be present when its sexual expression is to dehumanize femininity. As former pornography actress Shelley Lubin implored, quote, the real truth is we porn actresses want to end the shame and trauma of our lives, but we can't do it alone. We need you men to fight for our freedom and give us back our honor. We need you to hold us in your strong arms while we sob tears over our deep wounds and begin to heal. 
we want you to throw out your movies and help piece together the shattered fragments of our lives. We need you to pray for us so God will hear and repair our ruined lives. So don't believe the lie anymore. Porn is nothing more than fake sex and lies on videotape. Trust me, I know. With regard to same-sex families and the culture of internet pornography and changing gender roles, Will Durant's warning decades ago is most pertinent to our time. Quote, intellect is therefore a vital force in history, but it can also be a destructive and dissolvent, a, a dissolvent and destructive power. Out of every hundred new ideas, 99 or more will probably be inferior to the traditional responses which they propose to replace. No one man, however brilliant or well-informed, can come in one lifetime to such a fullness of understanding as to safely judge and dismiss the customs or institutions of his society. For these are the wisdom of generations after centuries of experiment in the laboratory of history. A youth boiling with hormones will wonder why he should not give full freedom to his sexual desires. And if he is unchecked by customs, morals, or laws, he may ruin his life before he matures sufficiently to understand that sex is a river of fire that must be banked and cooled with a hundred restraints if it is not to consume in chaos both the individual and the group. Robert Burns also predicted our cultural enigmas of today. Quote, but pleasures are like poppies spread. You seize the flower, its bloom is shed. Or like the snow falls in the river, a moment white, then melts forever. Or like the Borealis race that flit ere you can point their place. Or like the rainbow's lovely form, a vanishing amid the storm. So where do we go from here? I agree with Walter Newell, Dr. Newell, who said, quote, Hostility toward women is an aberration of male behavior. So the first step towards a sensible debate about manly pride is to rescue the positive tradition of manliness from three decades of stereotyping that conflates masculinity with violent hegemony and aggression. We have to recognize that men and women are moral and intellectual equals. That decent and worthy men have always known this and that while men and women share the most important human virtues, vices, and aptitudes, they also have different psychological traits that incline them toward different activities. The best way of convincing young men to treat women with respect is to educate them in those traditional values or virtues of character that make it a disgrace to treat anyone basely, dishonestly, or exploitably. Moreover, the surest way of raising young men to treat young women as friends rather than as objects for sexual exploitation is to appeal to their natural longing to be honored and esteemed by the young women to whom they are attached. When our erotic attraction to another is properly directed, it leads us to cultivate the virtues of moderation, honesty, gratitude, and compassion, all of which make us worthy of love in the eyes of the beloved. We try to be virtuous because we want to be worthy of being loved. Dr. David Gilmore concurs, quote, one of my findings here is that manhood ideologies always include a criteria of selfless generosity, even to the point of sacrifice. Again and again, we find that real men are those who give more than they take. They serve others. Let me close with a personal perspective on where we can go for these values. My wife, Jan, and I have both seen our parents reach 50 years of marriage. We both saw our fathers treat our mothers with tenderness and respect. In both instances, our fathers were stricken with devastating neurological conditions. This candid photo captured my parents when they were dating, before they were married. And the magic of complementary masculinity and femininity can be seen. He would go on to become a physician with mom working to pave the way through medical school. After 50 years of marriage, dad passed away from Parkinson's disease and mom repaid his many years of kindness in turn by turning her home into a hospice and caring for him 
with the same selflessness which he showed her all those earlier years. Similarly, my father-in-law, who was a college professor at BYU, suffered a brain aneurysm 17 years ago and has lived in a wheelchair with a severe disability since. My mother-in-law lovingly returns his years of service by caring for him day in and day out in her home. I believe this is the answer. Where do I see true masculinity and femininity? I see it in this picture of dad and mom. In their youthful adoration and excitement, I see the seeds of 50 years of marriage for which my gratitude cannot be adequately expressed with words. In their love, I see a force which would bask in the light of their marvelous accomplishments and weather the storms of their disappointments. Selflessness is stronger than selfishness, love stronger than lust, and peace stronger than pain. Let us as a people return to virtue, and in so doing, find ourselves again. Thank you, and God bless us in this endeavor. Great question. I think do what we're doing. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, Be creative. Uh, You know, whatever it is that will engage the young men, uh, connect with them, connect with your audience, uh, use your skills. Um, I think we have the data. The data's here. They like science. All the youth I know like science today. Back. One question. Sometimes. I find that on the checklists that young ladies now have, looking at it, the young man today, if they become a little more serious, particularly um, in a culture that says that pornography is not something that you would want in a, in a young man, but then seeing the numbers that uh, our BYU colleagues has come up with, which we probably viewing, when they, when they see the literature, at least in its popular form, on, on brain shrinkage, the frontal lobe that you presented, it, of course, frightens the young woman sometimes. And they wonder about long-term damage. Now, you, you mentioned that, that there's a possibility of regrowth. Could you speak a little bit more about the healing process from a medical perspective? Is there reversibility? Is there growth? Is there something that could be looked, hopefully, in the future for recovery on a, on a, from a physiological way? Yes, our best studies are with methamphetamine, and, uh, and we have, the, of course, the uh, VBM study out of Korea that did show uh, recovery of, of volume loss. And then Nora Volkow's study as well, looking at dopaminergic downgrading, that there was actually recovery in the dopaminergic pleasure systems with up to a year to a year and a half of recovery from methamphetamine addiction. And then there's the, um, the obesity paper that showed re- return to more normal white uh, matter ratios with recovery. Those are the only three studies that I know of right now that we can scan recovery, but I think it's enough to say that don't lose hope, that with recovery uh, the brain can heal. It's plastic to become addicted and it's also very plastic to heal. The issue is what do we do with this? You're a young woman, we want to consider marriage with a young man. Um, The important thing is to understand if the young man is viewing pornography, then if a person goes into a marriage with such a person without just face value, no other questions asked, you can keep looking at it, don't plan on a happy marriage. And the Bergner study published in the Journal of Sex and Marital Therapy bears that out, the peer-reviewed literature. Um, it doesn't make for a good marriage. Uh, there's a growing, we call it porn impotence. Dr. Doig, Dr. Klein have all written about it. Porn dependence where men literally become dependent upon pornography either visually and they're uh, looking at it while they're having sexual relations or replaying it in their minds to actually function sexually. It's a growing phenomenon. So um, the bottom line is we've taken this very casually. We, we've treated this powerful dopamine, this rocket fuel, 
and, and just treated it casually. We believed Kinsey, and we're in a hole now, but I am not advocating wringing our hands. I'm advocating rolling up our sleeves. My wife and I work with groups, community, religious others, to help with recovery groups for those seeking recovery. Um, and I personally know through those groups many who have experienced severe sexual addiction, pornography, and others who now have many years of complete healing and sobriety from those conditions. Dr. Patrick Carnes has written some of the best work on that. His book, Don't Call It Love, Out of the Shadows, and the Shadows of the Net. I would commend those to you. He talks about growth phase from sexual addiction, which is really kind of that real solid recovery phase growth stage he calls it, in about two years um, minimum. So the bottom line is that yes, uh, there are certainly, it, it's, it's a um, marriage is certainly not finished, but we have to go into it much more carefully now than before. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Sarah from Reality Shaman, which I also work with Yes, sir. Um, I hear in my research a lot about there's fast pressing and oxygen and the dopamine. Is there a way to get a quick overview from you, like the difference between them? Because I feel like they're all just Yeah, oxytocin is Larry Young's work, and then there's, and it's all, you've got all the references, should be in the handout. Um, it's the, the voles, you know, the little, the little prairie vole creatures, they're like little moles, and these little mammals uh, mate for life. And so what they did is they blocked, Larry Young's group and some other groups blocked the oxytocin receptors in those voles, and they quit mating for life and the women left their young. And then of course there's the study published that shows that oxytocin increases trust in humans. And so we understand now that these physiologic, sexually important uh, chemi chemicals that actually help us perform physically to reproduce ourselves also have emotional limbic effects with bonding to that object so that we can then stick around together and raise the children we have produced. That's the biologic uh, rationale for doing that. Vasopressin was shown to be more important for the males in those voles. So. You yes. argued that um, females are wired to bond. Mm -hmm. So how is one, um, is they presented the case that uh, from a sociobiological viewpoint, males um, are wired to the opposite because uh, things like the refractory tear disappear if a male goes with a, a, another female as opposed to saying with the same female and evidence like that. How would one respond to that trying to make an argument that humans are wired to bond when there's evidence supporting the other side? Oh, we're not just wired to bond. We're wired to want. I mean, there's no question about that. And that's an inherently biological, you're exactly right on that. But, and, and it is true that the recent study, um, it's, again, it's in, in the references, looking you know, from Laura Stepp's paper on, on depression at the girls at UCLA you know, uh, who were sexually promiscuous, as compared to the guys, that yes, the women experienced more depression with permissive sexuality than the men did at that stage. Go read, and again, this is heavy stuff, okay? It's, I'm, if you read it, read it carefully, and I don't want to trigger anyone. So their intent in writing these books is not to titillate, but they document what is there in the pornography and the sexuality of today. Pamela Paul's book, which she was here last year, Gail Dine's new book, Pornland. Very heavy, very, but when you read that, and, and particularly if you go back to Pamela's book and you read all the interviews of the males, and there's no, there's no religious overlay here. These are secular guys. There's the, the surgeon from Houston. There's, I mean, just on and on in the book. And it's very striking, um, the depression that years of vacant sex produces in men. That's an untold story. Um, and it's pretty well documented. Uh, Victor Klein talks about it in his writings, and others have. So to me, one, you know, yes, in the short term, it's wanting. We're wired to want and to bond, and the wanting can predominate, and the dopamine can override the euphoria, particularly if the sexuality is virtually nonstop, as on many college campuses. But after the years, the data suggests otherwise. 
that there is kind of a vacant period of, you know, sitting and staring at the wall. Um, a recent friend of mine, this man who, um, I, I personally know a man who basically ended up in a trailer. He goes home. He's lost a wife and numerous children. He's lost, he told me personally, over $2 million. And he goes home and gets internet pornography and masturbates to the pornography and watches it till he gets tired. When he can afford enough money, he hires a prostitute. And he's done that for years. He's lost everything in his life. He's miserable. So his wanting has predominated over the bonding. And he told me that he's extremely empty. Men do have a desire to be loved underneath that. They do. That, ha that story has not been told. Maybe that was thank Dr. Hill for the 